Welcome back to War in the East 2. This is Gamer1745. And continue to, we're going to continue the road to Minsk scenario as I'm learning the nuances of this game. <coughs> Excuse me. Just started talking here. Um, those of you who haven't been around a long time, I have played some War in the East 1, but never the full campaign. So this is still a learning process for me but before we get into all of that if you haven't already will you hit that subscribe button and of course hit that like button love to have you around more often i am really pleased and actually quite surprised at how many people have positively um, responded that they want to continue continue to see this series being played um i want to play this series um very much so but um with all the games that I cover, um, got to make choices. And so this is a significant game. A little about the way I don't learn well from reading manuals. Partially, maybe primarily, I find them incredibly boring. You know, I understand the words as they say them, but retaining that information for me is a difficulty. Um, I like manuals to look up something. You know, I need to look up how, what, where. To do something, that's fine in the manual. I can do that. But trying to just read manuals, uh, no. So I, as a child, learned by playing, you know, these type of, um, you know, board games with counters on, um, you know, the tabletop games or like micro armor. By watching others play and learning the rules that way. And now, of course, I can do that by watching YouTube or as, you know, computer games started to become a real thing um, by clicking on things and seeing how well they work. So that is part of it. Now, why I'm sort of mentioning all this is one that this is a, you're, you're joining me for a learning experience. Two, um, learn something. Okay, routed units. If you overrun them, and I have seen them that the, sometimes they'll fall back a bit further. Other times they just sort of go into a nebulous pool. Well, I thought they were sort of being um, overrun and destroyed. No, they're just going back and will reform. And so I gather um, when making pockets, you want to try to not disturb routed units as much as practical and create the pocket and then work, worry about that. And hopefully they will um, just decide to um, disappear as it were um, once um, you know the pockets formed and so if any of you who knows a thing in this that i'm either doing wrong or saying wrong please post it below um, we can all learn from it um, and you know i'm not going to talk a lot maybe well we'll see how the day goes here um, about the eastern front right now but um There's a huge debate on could Germany have won against the Soviet Union. And you know, I, I'll, take, I'll take a little bit of time. Um, yes, Germany could have won against the Soviet Union. And I'm sure we'll go into it in much greater detail later on. But there are several ways. One, you have to remember warfare is a political act. Okay, it's politics. Politics are perception. If Germany appeared to be unstoppable, and it's sort of like the, um, I don't know, tiger panic that uh, Americans often felt uh, when they were encountering German tanks, um, you know, after D-Day, every tank was, because they just saw, you know, bushed up hands or four that had all the, the Schutzen on the sides of them that sort of look square. It's a tiger, run away, run away. You know, tiger panic that they often had. And, you know, or the British um, got sort of desert fox panic, if you will, um, in North Africa until Monty came in and really, you know, pushed, pushed back hard against that. So you have um, elements like that, but you also have... Um, in, in political warfare is and I don't mean just political warfare as in like who's going to win an election but um, invading the Soviet Union could Germany have offered 
an alternative to um, Stalinist rule. Absolutely. Um, but they never did. Never. I mean, they did a bit to some of the ethnic minorities, uh, Baltic states and whatnot. But there was a huge exile army that um, was about half in Yugoslavia and about half in France. Well, the Yugoslavian bunch was rather pro-German invasion, at least as they understood it. Um, the Germany absolutely, and these are Russian, um, white Russians, and they're just second generation, but even the older guys were still maybe not fit enough to go into, you know, hard combat, but um, rear area security operations. Um, the Germans never let them out of Yugoslavia, the, the formed Russian, white Russian units. I don't entirely know the reason for this. I can speculate, and we'll probably talk about that sometime later on. Even later when they were creating the Pals of Adolf, you know, the um, Vasilev's um, collab large collaborationist army, they never let the Yugoslav Russians interact with them. Just, you know, it was ruthlessly never. Um, and the, the, the Russians more so in, that had been in France, weren't as pro-German as the Yugoslav ones. But, so if you offered whether it would be, I don't know if the white Russians coming back, if that's Return of the Tsar or something else. Now, it may have backfired, you know, um, but if you gave the Russian people an alternative, and yeah, yeah I mean, a, a Trotsky-ish, I mean, Trotsky eventually gets an ice pick in him, but, um, you know, it, even if it's some leftist socialist alternative to Stalin, you know, that's never offered to them um, as an option that, oh, hey, yeah, because that's, again, like in the Ukraine, Germans are overwhelmingly welcomed in the early days, not later on, but in the early days when they show up in Ukraine because of the Holodomor and, yeah, hey, you know, we want these evil communists gone that have starved us. Now, the Germans might not be any better as they come to find out, or maybe even worse, but um, there's an initial, you know, wave of, of relief as they, as they arrive. So you can do a political warfare that could collapse the Soviet Union. Two, if the war somehow, we could quickly, and again, I'm going to go through this quickly, and I know people... Sorry, jump ahead if you want to to a screen that's different than this one, you know, here. Um, if you want to jump up past my talks. Um, we could easily see what if um, Halifax didn't blink when he, Churchill, and Chamberlain went in the room privately as to who was going to secede um, Chamberlain. Had, because... Um, Churchill turns his back and looks out the window, sort of like refusing to push himself and refusing to, um, you know, nominate um, Halifax. So Halifax sort of blinks and basically um, endorses the idea of Churchill being the next prime minister. But had he like pushed himself forward, I will lead this country through our dark days ahead and bring a better future for us. Or, you know, I don't know, some little little bit of a speech to Chamberlain and got Chamberlain behind Halifax, who was the more popular with the, um, the conservative party officials, I would say, at that time. Um, you know, Churchill's star was very much rising as Lord of Ad the Admiralty, but he had made a lot of enemies in the conservative party. Um, and Halifax, my understanding, did not. So had Halifax not blinked and had this happens while France still exists as a fighting power, sort of, you know, because Churchill's as prime minister, his big thing is shuttle diplomacy back and forth. Had he come, had Halifax come in and Halifax recognized the truth of the situation that we're just, we can't win against Germany. We just must make some sort of reasonable political settlement and try to push for a settlement much better than what happened, uh, you know, um, to the French. You know, I don't know whether Paris would be occupied or whatnot, but, you know, a, a cease of hostilities while you still have a French army existing and you still have a British army and navy and air force still very much ex 
existing and set up a peace in the West and had then it allowed to be what in essence, you know, in Italy, um, you know, goes back to being neutral and having just a big German, Hungarian, Romanian brawl with the Soviet Union, you know, sort of isolated and they're not worried about being attacked by America, by Britain, by whatever, and they're able to import, especially because, you know, the settlements for the end of hostilities, um, import, um, you know, needed uh, materials into Germany, including oil. I think a sort of, you know, Germany and a few collaborationist countries in the East can defeat the Soviet Union even in a war of attrition. And that even if somebody like America is pumping resources into uh, and maybe finished equipment into the Soviet Union, I still think Germany could, not would, you know, would for sure, but could defeat the Soviet Union. If it's just sort of a one-on-one -on -one match, that could happen. And, and I, I just explained what I would say is a realistic um, setting for that to, to potentially to have happened, the Halifax government. Or three, if the general conditions existed as they did in World War II, and if the war can be maintained as one of maneuver and decision, and, a, and not a war of attrition. A good maneuver and decision war would be the German invasion of France, the sort of initial um, fall gelb and then um, fall rot pushing down into Paris um, is a good example of what I mean by maneuver and decision. Had they been able to maintain that kind of warfare, and what some of the German generals, including people like Guderian, who, oh, hell yeah, um, we can't, we didn't take Moscow. They, you know, counterattacked us and we retreated back and we're holding the line. If they had gone back to, okay, retreat, 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 you know, in an orderly manner, way back to, you know, somewhere like the Minsk, you know, sort of, you know, this sort of, this line down and we can't go on, but down to, you know, to the Black Sea, to a narrow line, get to a line that we can hold and hold strong and build up our strength and then, you know, maneuver swiftly around, blast, encircle, crush. And then, oh, well, we just crushed three big Soviet armies and, oh, things aren't looking good. Back to our, you know, our line of holding that is still somewhat of an attritional warfare. But because Hitler insists upon trying to hold all territory gained for some good reasons, maybe not reasons justifying the cost, but for some good reasons, including resources, because you can't, they need the resources from the Soviet Union and they can't constantly be letting the Soviets have control of them. But had they been able to maintain, um, you know, starting, you know, the big, when do you do the start date on um, you know, the invasion and whatnot. So um, had you done a situation where you can keep that momentum going and when it stalls, realize it. And often the, the, the not just the soldier in the front line, but the generals, the core level or whatever, realizing when the things are stalled to then do tactical withdrawals to, you know, more secure positions, wait for supplies and whatever to catch up to you, and then, you know, burst out again and keep that as a series of, of vigorous attacks. You can see the early days of um, going into, uh, what is it, um, Fall Blue? Uh, sorry, I don't remember all of them. Uh, the, the attack into, you know, the Caucasus that ended up becoming the stalemate in, in Stalingrad. But, you know, keep those kinds of things moving. And when they, you know, had you kept the war, and they can't, if it keeps going too long, like you see in the American Civil War, where you do have these sort of brilliant moves by the Confederates, it still becomes, in essence, ultimately, because um, the Confederates were never able to go into, truly into the heartland of the Union and crush its industrial capacity. Um, you have to be able to go in and crush the industrial capacity of the Soviet Union. So if it's purely just big maneuvers, you're just being more smart, if you will, with an attritional warfare. And so long as, again, the rest of the conditions obtain, 
Britain's still in the war, the U.S. comes into the war, all that. Germany will will for, for sure eventually lose, because so long as it is attritional in nature, Germany will lose in the end um, of the situation without something else going on. So those are the sort of three conditions that I can see. A political alternative to the Russian people, notice I didn't say Soviet, than the, the current Soviet government, a somehow setting up conditions so that it's just a German-Soviet matchup, again, quite possible, um, or just executing Barbarossa and others in a more vigorous manner. And because, you know, just we can look at, you know, and some of this is, well, what if, what if Nazis weren't Nazis, as some people have asked, some author, I remember, um, I think it was asking in a lecture I saw or question and answer of Adam Toes, one of the things, well, what if the Germans were, you know, didn't, you know, treated their slave labor or whatever better or some such thing? And yeah, well, um, well, if Nazis weren't Nazis, things would be different. Well, and okay, very much so. But we know, even if the Nazis are still going to be Nazis, Germany, the Germans, the Nazis, understood this sort of cycle that we go through every year. It gets warmer and it gets colder, it gets warmer, it gets colder. They, they knew of winter and summer. They knew they were invading the Soviet Union. Even if they thought it was going to be another France type thing and all the people just hate Stalinism and just kick in the door and the house of cards will fall down. Even if they thought all of that to be true, which many did, did they not understand that they were going to have to occupy significant elements of it? Did they not understand that they would need to have not just in existence, but I don't think it was very much in existence, but in existence, winter clothing and winterization of motor, motor vehicles and such, and have a plan to get that clothing to and other, you know, um, antifreeze and whatever else you may need for the vehicles, get that to the units that were going to occupy the captured lands, have that in place prior to invading the Soviet Union. So even with the greatest success, you're still going to have your, your troops, um, you know, die of frostbite. You know, um, so some of these kind of things, so even if you still, you know, even if you go, oh, well, the Nazis just expected this game, or you, you got to understand, they just didn't consider the idea of, of defeat a, a practical reality. Okay. But still, they knew winter was coming. They might not have known it was going to be as bad it was, as it was for that first winter, but they knew it was coming. And the Germans, um, you have people like... Um, uh, Rosenberg, who was one of the Nazi theorists, who was born in the East and was a German from, you know, the German communities in former Russia. So you have definitely high up Nazis that lived through Russian winters. Uh, and so it's not like some mysterious land they hadn't been to before. Like you might say, I mean, obviously some had been, but, um, you know, North Africa, but you got, hey, no, he, of course, flies out to... Um, England, Hess was born in Alexandria, Egypt, and grew up there as a young child. Um, I don't think it was too old when his family moved back to Germany or um, uh, yeah, Austro-Hungarian Empire. I forget which one. I think he was maybe, no, I think he was more Bavarian. I'm not sure. But yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, so it's not some mysterious lands they didn't have knowledge of. They knew what was going on. They knew the railways were different. They knew all this stuff even if their success happened. Okay, well, so that so that's why, that's one of the things I am very passionate about and why I like war games is the what ifs that are, at least mostly in my, my judgment, realistic. Um, right, okay, mentioning all that, we want to create this pocket. So, um, well, Let's come back here. Let's let's look at well I don't think we need a a super vigorous fighting unit, so motorized speed is more important for what I want to do right now than
Uh, that's what is that's like uh, well, we can get to there. I just exhausted the hell out of this motor. Oh, this is Gross Deutschland Motorized Regiment. Well, okay. Um, maybe it's the lack of a nearby command structure. It could be it. I don't know. Like I say, I am learning this. Maybe you know better than I do. Okay, well. No, I don't want to come near these units. So what I want to do is here. Wow, this is just, maybe it's just the terrain. Okay, climate, human, ground, clear, air, clear. Doesn't look particularly bad. Well, we can get to there. That's what I wanted to do with that. Now let's... I know we have this unit here, but I wanted to come in here and make sure we create a pocket here. So I wanted that pocket. Now, like I say, I've been advised to sort of let these units sit there and pocket them, but here I I know we um, won't have the okay the so the the overrun unit I don't know if we go here or did it just fall back into some other element but the air defense um, battalion surrendered but I want to get all these railroads now we, they they won't be immediately usable by us but the sooner we get them I do very much believe the um, more effective they will be for us in repairing them. So, you know, by keeping these headquarters moving up. Okay, well, okay, so this regiment, or this division, I should say, is attached straight to the um, Overcommando de Hares, Overcommando de Luftwaffe, Hagering, and what had, uh, had the, yeah. So that's their headquarters in Danzig. I guess I am going to leave them there, even though these guys have moved up to here. Now, okay, now if we do a um, deliberate attack, yeah, let's see if we do this. They're routed and went. I don't know if what happened to that unit since we did it within a pocket. Again, people inform me below. I am not presenting myself um, as a, um expert on all this. So don't take it as such, and now I want, where are your subunits? No. It always seems strange with me as you look on the ones you don't want to have. Okay, they can come up to here, I guess. I see some more here. Okay, 19th Panzer Division. I'm going to try to reduce this mostly with infantry. Um,
So while these Soviet forces are, shall we say, in shock, Six and okay, twenty nine to one. Well, if you're going to get him, let's get him hard. Okay, the artillery surrendered the tank, tank division routed. Very good. Don't know where it routed to, if it matters at this point, but I didn't want them to, no, I don't know that we need to, yeah, that's probably good enough, they surrendered, very good, Okay, now I don't know if it's a mistake, but I'm not going to push on this super hard. Um, just at this moment. I want to get a lot of these forces. You can see here this force is in good shape. These are, um, you know, a lot of fatigue from moving and attacking, so their readiness state is low. I don't think that is too far back. Okay. Um, I will bounce this one unit, but I do want to pursue up to here. Okay, um, looks like yes. Okay, so it's subunits. Forward to here. And so are these, so. I may be making a bad job of all this. I am not sure at all. I think if we just move these forward a little bit here, keep them from being too exhausted, but get them moving. Panzer Division. Oh, 
you know, a little worried about attempts to break out and what may happen, but I don't think they're going to move much. Now, the 8th SS Cavalry Brigade. Um, I think that is a um, not a Waffen SS unit per se. Um, there were. Um, Various SS units, including Totenkopf units, and I'm not talking about the Totenkopf division. Um, there were um, various other, you know, the Einsatzgruppen and others that were armed, but they weren't part of the Waffen SS. I'm not sure about the 8th SS um, Cavalry Brigade, so I'm not anticipating it being overly strong. But it might just be helpful in, you know, rear air or security in the realms of keeping corridors open and that kind of thing. A little more mobile. Um, okay, well, we can get here with the security. Detachment, security division. I'm just going to sort of use these to notice I'm sticking them on. Um, all the HQs to sort of make sure that they don't just get attacked by something fairly heavy and overrun. Yeah, I know there's a few more units I can move, but I think we're just going to, if nothing else, I want to see how um, the Soviets react to this in turn without AI. No, okay. Um, Allow AI to manage depots, yes. Okay. There we go. I think that. And I'm taking that to be supply depots in that element. Enter, yes. Okay, so they're air freighting in some supplies. Good. Now, air freighting is different necessarily. I mean, there is a, a parachute um, uh, emblem there. But notice it was coming to an air base. So you you got to understand, um, obviously, this game uh, scale, you can have the air bases more so on the map, where I'm often playing things like Hearts of Iron. And people, I remember years ago now, someone was, you know how hard it is to airdrop fuel, blah, blah, blah. They couldn't have done it in any, you know, in any meaningful way in World War II. And I'm thinking, well, on Hearts of Iron scale, about all those provinces, there's a, some area flat enough in that province for somebody to cut down enough trees to be able to land aircraft to unload equip, you know, supplies and take off again. That doesn't mean that there's an air base there in which you can rearm, uh, do maintenance for the, the aircraft and all of that type of stuff that's a proper air base. So you need to be able to fly there. You know, maybe some aircraft is, you know, flying in some aircraft fuel to refuel if somebody's particularly low to fly back. You know, if they were flying heavy loads of equipment in and others flow in some extra aircraft or fuel to, you know, to fly back out if needed, but it's not really an operational air base. So now here, obviously, um, a lot of the open um, 
areas with the right ground um, element, you're, you know, it's flat enough, hard enough, not snowing, not whatever. You can probably land a lot of the transports on to do um, supply missions, but definitely to an airbase, you can bring in supply. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, airdrop supplies into a pocket that's, you know, surrounded or something. Well, again, you know, the, most of the supplies going into Stalingrad were landed on air bases and not airdropped. Saving good. Okay. Turn summary. Friendly losses. So we lost almost 4,000 men. Um, 68 guns, 69 tanks, 177 aircraft. Um, looks like the Soviets may have lost a lot more. Um, men, artillery, aircraft. Okay. I mean, I sort of get what some of this is saying, but I don't necessarily understand the meaning of all of this the combat alert 73 i guess those supply alerts strength alerts okay um i know we're still in the air phase let's look at supply alerts here I'm trying to see if there's something that's like oh no you're running out of supplies supplies are all gone Okay, I'm not really, I mean, I see that there, but, um, right, okay, so that's turn summary. Now, um, I don't think I'm going to try to change any of the missions for the, um, air directives, continue to their current directives. So we're going to want, yeah, execute the air directives. Partially out of lack of good knowledge and just sort of time and thinking that if they were pounding air bases before, they should continue. <coughs> so, you know, nothing's changed that much. Okay, they're all operated. Um, well, not a lot of, not much happened. So I don't know if I should have done more, add more directives or not. I don't know. Again, if somebody knows, they can po point to things and I'll learn this better. Okay. So now we have a pocket here that is fairly well established. We are closing in on Minsk, but we, I'm pre, well, I'm presuming, well, maybe. Okay, before I do anything, let's come over to admin. Um, let's hit this and LP02. Let's play 02. Save. Yes, Minsk, just this open. Okay, we captured the depot there. Wow. They, so that all this, they really just decided, well, okay, I mean, it's not a bad, looking at the AI here, we've got forces that are using this river as a line of defense. I don't know quite that the HQ there is in a good spot here, um, but... If this is a supply source down here, then that is reasonable. This looks like they just moved everything back out of the way. Some moderately strong armor forces up here. Something that you want to hit with two or three divisions at least. A good coordinated attack. But we've created a major pocket here. Okay, well, they um, routed.
brought it back down to there. Okay, 22. Oh, I don't know if we need to do this. Yeah, that's probably good enough. Okay, they both surrendered. Very good. I think that's a good push to make it. Yeah, some of the railways. Hopefully I can move in some of the infantry divisions to keep that pocket closed. Move up to this junction. The air bases. Move up to there. Well, as I said, I want to keep sort of Pushing on these things, okay, not quite good enough that I want to attack. While shifting these forces, yeah, I guess so. Well, I think we're going to end this episode here. I hope um, this whets your appetite for the grand campaign. Like I said before, um, there's just so many things to play and present on this channel, and I really want to present this, but it does need to have a decent audience. So if it's there, um, we will play the grand campaign. After I play a couple of these scenarios, there's also another learning scenario that's later in the war that I think is more of a defensive thing. Learn that, get you know reasonably competent for this, and then we can look at and talk about um, the grand campaign and play that i really love to do that for you so thank you all um very much for making it this far see you next time for more historical gaming